Mara, oh, thank, you. thank you. All right, so today we're gonna to be introducing uh, Elena uh, Kochkina uh, to the AI seminar. Um, Elena is a postdoctoral researcher at the Queen Mary University of London and the Alan Turing Institute in London. Uh, her research is on tackling misinformation in social media conversations using NLP. Elena obtained a PhD in urban science from the University of Warwick and spent part, uh, part of it uh, based in the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, she earned, um, she has a joint master's in complex system science from the U University of Warwick and Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden, and she, as well as a master's and uh, BS in applied mathematics and informatics at the Lebachevsky State University in uh, Nizhny Novgorod. Am I saying that correctly? Well, almost, yes, Nizhny Novgorod. <laughs> as well as I can do. Uh, Christina, someone I work with a lot, she she um, was born in Russia. She could say that probably much better than I could. Uh, anyway, with that, I'll let you take it over. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to give a talk. Um, so this is quite like a general uh, overview uh, talk about the sort of state of the field of automated rumor verification, um, focusing on social media conversations. And this is um, like my current topic of research. And it's been my topic of research since the beginning of my PhD. Um, so uh, we can start with um, some motivation for this research. <laughs> Social uh, media platforms, uh, you know, are popular nowadays as uh, news sources, as they often deliver updates faster than traditional media. So unfortunately, the absence of story verification on these platforms gives rise to proliferation of misinformation. And uh, these unfiltered and often malicious posts can have a significant negative impact on different spheres of society. Um, as an example, currently, along with the coronavirus pandemic, the public is facing a misinfodemic widespread of rumors and conspiracy theories about COVID-19. Uh, so this kind of misinformation can create panic, affect rates of transmission, encourage trade in untested treatments, and which all effectively puts people's lives in danger. So on the slide, you can see some examples from a pointer uh, website uh, where, which, which collects uh, fact-checked articles uh, from various fact-checking organizations. Um, so interestingly, um, so this proliferation of misinformation online uh, leads to high levels of concern amongst users, which information is real and which is fake on the internet. Um, so uh, Reuters Institute Digital News Report uh, that average level of trust in the news across all countries and platforms uh, included in their, in their study is down to 42%, uh, with less than half of respondents agreeing that they trust the news media that they themselves use. Um, and uh, I guess the more recent uh, reports uh, showing as well that news avoidance is becoming more widespread, um, I guess in particular uh, with relation to COVID-19 news. Um, and people are saying that they're trying to avoid news about COVID-19 because of the effect it has on their mood. Um, this is uh, understandable. However, interestingly, news avoidance is higher amongst users of sources that rely on intentional exposure, such as television news, uh, which, you know, these sources would also have the verification process in place, um, compared to those sources that rely more on incidental exposure, such as social media and messaging apps. So, um, Traditionally, rumor verification and fact-checking are performed manually by professionals. And in recent years, there are more and more uh, initiatives have been launched by journalists and fact-checkers uh, to address the, this problem. 
However, uh, manual fact checking and verification cannot scale to address the amount of circulating rumors and cannot be easily performed in real time. And therefore, there is a need for automated system that would assist in the process. And so we turn to machine learning and natural language processing. Uh, so in the context of my work and uh, in the context of this talk, um, um, the rumors are defined as circulating stories of questionable veracity, which are apparently credible, but hard to verify and produce sufficient skepticism uh, to motivate finding out the actual truth. So, uh, like, I guess the, the main points are that rumors are unverified stories. Uh, they are spreading widely um, and they are uh, check worthy. So basically, they are verifiable, uh, but they are also kind of important to verify. Um, if I lied to you that I have a red car, it would not be very interesting to verify. <laughs> um, and then in my work and in this talk, uh, at least so far, I primarily focus on uh, Twitter conversations. Uh, so rumor uh, resolution is a complex process and it involves multiple subtasks. So on this slide, you can see an example of rumor verification pipeline. Uh, of course, more steps can be added and some can be combined or omitted, uh, but this one is that the one that we use so far. Uh, so it starts with uh, rumor detection. Uh, so this can be viewed as a binary classification task uh, of identifying check worthy stories. Uh, so rumors versus non rumors where non-rumors would be um, opinions or other chat. Um, then it goes on to rumor tracking, uh, which involves collection of sources that are discussing a uh, given rumor. Uh, and then identifying stance of those sources, um, which can be either supporting, denying, questioning, or commenting. Uh, and then the final step is rumor verification. Um, so which can be viewed as a sort of three class classification as either true, false, or uh, it remains unverified. Um, so here on the slide, uh, you can see um, an example of a conversation on Twitter that is discussing a false rumor about Michael Essien having Ebola uh, and different, uh, different types of reactions to this uh, rumor. And so our task based on a conversation like this uh, uh, to make this uh, prediction, uh, whether it's true, false or unverified. As you can imagine with high importance of the problem of rumor spread, um, rumor verification is an active research area in NLP. I guess it also will come as no surprise that uh, the most popular methodology uh, to tackle this is deep learning. Here on the slide, I have listed some types of approaches uh, with respect to which information is being leveraged. Um, of course, these are not exclusive of each other, and a lot of works use combinations of these. Um, and I will describe each of these approaches in a little bit more detail with the example of a recent study that utilizes it. Um, and in some of these, uh, I will go into more detail uh, to talk about my work. So um, I guess uh, the most obvious uh, is uh, linguistic features and lexical cues and majority of existing rumor verification models utilize these. Uh, so these can be in a form of um, you know, text representation, like represent the text of a conversation. Um, it can be, you know, a model of choice, bag of words, word to back, birth, and so on. Also, this can be defined as a presence of relevant keywords. Uh, one might choose to focus on the use of negation or the use of swear words. Um, I would say that, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, uh, there's no universally agreed on feature set that is indicative of rumor veracity. Um, often findings of different studies are relying on different data sets and they struggle to generalize to unseen data and at times contradict each other. 
So, um, for example, um, a study by Chua et al. Uh, found that the use of sentiment and rumors could not predict their veracity, uh, while Kwon et al. Uh, found sentiments useful in predicting rumor veracity on Twitter. So one needs to be careful uh, when drawing conclusions about such features, uh, whether they are uh, an artifact uh, of a particular topic or a data set. Um, I guess one thing I also could mention is that uh, it's hard to say if there's a one single uh, best performing model uh, for rumor verification as well, uh, because again, they're often evaluated on different data sets. Um, rumor stories tend to develop in time, attracting uh, more attention and opinions, um, as well as more relevant information may surface. Uh, and therefore, rumor resolution can be seen as a time-sensitive process. So uh, this consideration gives rise to studies that consider a timeline of a rumor with its growing context, as well as the structure of a conversation or a propagation path. Uh, so here on the slide, um, there is a, a model proposed by Maetal um, that relies on 3GRU, and you can see that the structure of the model mimics the structure of the conversation uh, that you can see on the left. So uh, they found that this model achieves higher performance comparing to approaches that ignore, ignore structural component. Uh, also, interestingly, they uh, performed um, comparison of um, using the information propagation in a top-down approach, so like from source tweet to the leaf nodes and also in um, bottom-up approach, uh, where information goes from the leaf nodes up to the source node. Um, and I found it interesting that the, the top-down approach that, again, sort of mimics the way the conversation develops led to a better performance in their case. Um, also, uh, a number of works are using um, information about users and their network, uh, and they incorporate it in their rumor verification models. Uh, so this could be uh, a features representing user, users, such as um, number of followers, account age, um, and also a rumor propagation path for a network. So uh, the model um, that I chose here as an example actually builds on the model that I showed in the previous slide that is, um, you know, in, it, uh, this would be a propagation tree encoder, but they also combine it with a user encoder uh, where they use graph convolutional neural networks. Um, so it includes network of users who post, repost, or reply to the claim, as well as their profile information. And they report uh, improvement over previous approaches and a baseline that only uses propagation uh, tree encoder. Um, maybe now would be a good time if there are any questions. Okay. Um, so I'll continue to uh, the next um, set of approaches that are incorporating uh, rumor stance information. So uh, this was a topic that uh, I particularly paid attention to in my work. Um, so what is rumor stance classification? Uh, it is in itself a, an interesting and challenging task to perform mathematically. Uh, so rumor stance classification is a task of determining opinion of a post uh, towards a rumor. Um, responses can be of different types, uh, supporting, denying, uh, question, questioning, uh, querying, um, or commenting. Uh, so you can see on the slide that each of the responses is tagged uh, with its stance towards a rumor. And so why do we care what people say on the internet? <laughs> well, it's because previous studies have shown that rumors that attract a lot of skepticism are more likely to be proven false later. So uh, rumor about shared task uh, was proposed to test the hypothesis regarding the synergy between stance and rumor veracity classification. Um, rumor val consists of two subtasks, uh, A, rumor stance classification, and B, 
rumor veracity classification. Uh, the task had two editions in 2017 and in 2019. So in 2017, I was a participant of the subtask A of this task. Um, uh, and our system was the, the winning system of it. Um, and the conclusion that we, we made for ourselves is that also modeling conversation structure is beneficial for this task. And in um, 2019, um, I, I was part of organizing committee for, for these, um, for rumor about. And I want to discuss the conclusions that we made, made based on participating systems. So in 2017, um, the winning system of rumor classification, rumor veracity classification task, NLTMRG, was the only system that used stance as a feature to predict rumor veracity. Uh, it was a fairly simple model. So it was linear SVM and input consisted of source tweet represented as bag of words uh, with additional features incorporating presence of URL, presence of hashtag and stance as proportion of supporting, denying and querying tweets in the thread. Uh, so I guess this was one of the, like, the earliest precedents showing that stance can be useful for rumor veracity classification. And in the next edition of Rumor Val in 2019, the best performing system uh, also incorporated stance as a feature and they used percentage of each stance type. Uh, however, their model was uh, more complex and it utilized an ensemble of classifiers and they also used information about rumor content, source credibility, user credibility, user stance and event propagation path. Um, So we can see that stance can be useful as a feature in a rumor verification model. Uh, so the next question we asked uh, whether this will be useful as an auxiliary task in a multitask learning setup. So we decided to test it uh, using the following model. So um, I, we, um, we structured input to our model as linear branches of tweets. So you can see uh, sort of a conversation structure on the right uh, on the slide. So conversation generally has tree-like structure. Um, for our model, we extracted linear branches of tweets and then these were became an input to an LSTM layer, sort of feeding in one tweet at a time. Um, and then, um, so based on this, um, we trained this model to perform um, veracity classification task, but also we uh, experimented with adding auxiliary tasks of rumor detection and rumor stance classification. Um, we evaluated these uh, approaches uh, on um, two data sets. One was rumor val 2017. Um, so this is also the data set where we take uh, stance labels from. So you can see this is a fairly small data set uh, of only 320 uh, conversation threads uh, and split into training, development, testing, um, fairly balanced for veracity and <laughs> very, very imbalanced in terms of stance. A majority of responses are commenting. Um, however, we also used a larger data set, uh, theme. Uh, so theme data set contains uh, rumors and also non-rumors. Um, each rumor is um, labeled as true, false, and unverified. And the interesting th th thing here is that um, each of the rumors is related to some uh, newsworthy event. Uh, so it contains five larger events. Uh, that contain um, all types of rumors um, and the four smaller events where usually the whole event is, uh, is centered at around one, one rumor story. Um, and so why this is important is because uh, we adopt uh, so-called leave one event out cross-validation setup. So it means we train on uh, a set of events and then we evaluate on the event unseen during uh, training. So this becomes a very challenging setup that sort of 
imitates the real world scenario when we don't know what the next rumor is going to be about. So here are um, the results uh, in terms of macro averaged F1 score uh, for our models. Uh, so we can see that. Um, uh, so yeah, we evaluated it on the three data sets. Um, and here we can see that our multitask learning approaches that are incorporating uh, rumor stance or rumor detection outperform single task learning approaches. And um, we gain even more performance uh, if we incorporate all three of the tasks. Um, so um, there also have been other works uh, that are using multitask learning for rumor verification um, that are also coming to similar conclusions, uh, showing that stance classification can be useful as auxiliary task in a joint learning setup uh, for rumor verification. So the work I'm showing on the slide, they actually uh, looked at a uh, task they called rumor detection, which is a four class classification task of non rumor, true, false, or unverified. Um, and they came to similar conclusions, um, you know, using different data sets. Um, so moving on. Um, so I mentioned that. Um, a lot of approaches are trying to incorporate conversation structure and also multitask learning. And there are um, approaches that are combining both of these. Uh, so here on the slide is work that is using tree LSTM and uh, multitask of uh, two tasks again and report performance improvements over branch LSTM multitask and also an LTM regime. So basically, we can see that uh, multitask learning uh, or with uh, stance classification task is aiding rumor veracity and also incorporating conversation structure is also helpful in rumor verification models. Um, so this model on the slide is um, using a variational autoencoder for representing rumors and also a multitask learning setup with uh, four different tasks, uh, incorporating rumor detection, rumor tracking, stance classification, and well, the main task, veracity classification. Um, so this model was evaluated on five largest events in theme data set, and it is a current state of the art in um, rumor verification on this data set. Um, So there are a couple more interesting studies um, about use of stance classification for rumor verification that I wanted to talk about. Um, unless there are any questions that I can take at this point. I have a question, actually. So can you mention again what he uses ground truth for rumors? This is just the... Snops and those those websites as the ground truth of rumors. Um, actually, so yeah, it depends which data set I'm using. So I was talking about using theme data set. So the way theme data set was collected is um, that they were collecting all sorts of conversations relevant to an event. So events in theme data set, for example, would be like shooting in Charlie Hebdo, and when the event was happening. Um, all sorts of um, tweet conversations were collected. And then these conversations were passed on to a journalist who identified uh, rumor stories in this, in this collection of conversations and also verified them, which ones are true and which ones are false. Mm -hmm. um, so this approach is actually quite uncommon in the field and more common, as you mentioned, is to use uh, Snopes or other fact-checking websites uh, to to identify already verified claims and then find sort of relevant Twitter conversations for for those and right. um, As, yeah the data sorry um, and I was just wondering for um, in general is there how much has has anybody actually compared different ground truth data see how much agreement there is about um, 
whether they will classify the same events or the same stories as rumors or not. Has anybody done this? How much of it is subjective and how, how much of the ground truth is purely objective? Um, yeah, I haven't seen any studies like this, I guess. So for theme data set, this was, um, I guess, a, a one journalist who, who annotated the data for true and false labels. Mm -hmm. So I guess we just choose to, to trust that person. And I guess the mm -hmm. same goes for people who are using Snopes. Uh, I guess they also just uh, take the label that sort of Snopes or pointer attached to the rumor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't okay. seen well, it. Well, thank you. Interesting. I was curious about that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, one question I have actually to follow up. Um, so with the stance, you're, you're basically looking at whether people's replies seem to uh, uh, be skeptical of the original tweet, as I understand it. And if so, uh, does that mean that the, this rumor could be simply manipulated to sound more true? Because, you know, the, these rumors could be spread by automated accounts or, or not. But you could have automated accounts just say, oh, yeah, this is true, this is true, this is true. And in doing so, it would give this, your, your, your algorithm, a false sense of, of tr trustworthiness, which could promote a tweet that would otherwise be false. Yeah, that, I, I that think that's, that's a very fair point. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, these other couple of studies that I wanted to mention, again, about using stance for rumor verification. Um, Dan's at all, uh, they, um, they basically proposed a model uh, that is um, based on like a variant of hidden Markov model um, in which they uh, only used information about stance and tweet times, ignoring language spe specific features. Uh, and they, I mean, they also reported um, like good results on a subset of theme data set. Um, so actually, and well, their approach outperforms stance and aware baselines as well. Um, so this performance is hard, their performance is a bit hard to compare to other works on theme data set because of difference in evaluation setup. But it led to another interesting work uh, by Lily et al. Uh, so they used um, this model proposed by Dangs et al. Um, on uh, rumors that were being spread in Danish, in, in well, in on Reddit, but in Danish language, and they were also analyzing the stance of conversation participants. Uh, so, what their study suggested that uh, models that use only stance labels from conversation in one language can be transferred effectively to predict veracity in conversations held in another language. So um, their study suggests that stance-based veracity could work across uh, languages and platforms. So um, yes, I guess it's still prone <laughs> to being manipulated by uh, you know, malicious users or bots, uh, but I find this uh, quite interesting um, conclusion uh, because it show, it's kind of one of the features that could contribute to generalizability of rumor verification models. So uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk also about like the goals and challenges that we are facing in in this um, domain of automated rumor verification. Um, so of course we strive for uh, mod like the best model performance for the highest accuracy. Um, uh, however, we the model also should be able to generalize to unseen rumors resolve rumors at an early stage, uh, provide justification for its predictions, and uh, it would be nice if it wouldn't exhibit significant biases. Um, so uh, here are, I guess, my, my thoughts and suggestions uh, on each of these points. Uh, so one thing uh, in my studies I find important is to use leave one event leave one event out cross-validation, or more generally, test models on unseen rumors and topics. Um, so I find that if in my experiments with theme data set, if I use this uh, leave one event out cross-validation, um, I get performance about 20% lower 
than if I just used uh, like a random split into cross-validation false. So basically, if, if I have an overlap in events across the, not necessarily the same rumor stories, but just the events, um, I still get a, a lot higher performance than if I, you know, test on unseen events. Um, yeah, I guess one way as well is to look into creating or using large training data sets covering a variety of topics. And uh, also search for topic independent features uh, that are indicative of rumor veracity. Um, so as we can see, um, as we've seen before, the user stance could be one of those features. Um, also, early resolution of rumors uh, is important uh, because the earlier we can start spreading the correct information, the earlier we can start sort of interference with false rumors, um, the, the lower impact it will have. And so some works tried to demonstrate the efficiency of their models um, at early rumor resolution by providing performance at different points in rumor timeline as more information becomes available. And I guess here also would be to search for features present at early stages of a rumor. Um, so I guess here, if this would be sort of a vote against using stance, uh, because uh, I guess for stance, we need to wait for comments to brew <laughs> in order to start using them somewhat. Um, also, uh, I guess um, check systems for biases. I guess this applies to like a lot of um, you know NLP models uh, that can influence um, decisions. In particular, um, source bias. Uh, so if we consider a certain um, account or a certain a certain venue trustworthy, should we just blindly always trust everything that comes out of it? And 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 vice versa. If somebody witnessed something and created Twitter account just to talk about it, should we also think, oh, this is a new account, we should not trust it. So how to treat those kind of biases. And um, I believe this should be all resolved in conversations with practitioners and end users. Um, and another uh, very important point is that systems should uh, provide uh, explanations in order to establish trust with end users. Um, so things to do could be uh, provide explanations by neural attention mechanisms or uh, another explainable AI methods, uh, maybe provide levels of uncertainty or consider other prediction formats beyond binary true and false decisions, um, such as summaries or, you know, highlighting uh, certain passages in the evidence. Um, so uh, in this line, um, I would like to talk about um, uh, one of our recent projects on estimating predictive uncertainty for rumor verification models. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions about the previous presentation as well at this point. I think we can wait till the end. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Right, so um, rumor verification is the type of task where the cost of incorrect prediction uh, can be high. And so it is desirable that an automated verification system does not only make a judgment, but that it can also inform a human fact checker uh, of its uncertainty. Understanding what a model doesn't know uh, can help us determine when we can trust its output and at which stage information needs to be passed on to a human. Um, so in this project, we estimate a uh, predictive uncertainty of rumor verification models to gain some understanding of models decisions and filter out cases that are hard for the model. So the approach that we adopt uh, required minimal changes to a given model and relatively computationally inexpensive. Um, so first of all, uh, we used a, a baseline model. Um, so it's a single task uh, branch LSTM model. Uh, this was also like a baseline for Rumor Val 2019 and the baseline in the multitask learning uh, project. So a conversation is decomposed into linear branches and then the model 
um, uses an LSTM, LSTM layer to incorporate um, tweets uh, in a branch. And then it makes a prediction per branch. And then we uh, aggregate predictions over all of the branches in the tree, such that we get the final uh, decision about the thread, uh, whether it's true, false, or unverified. Um, and uh, we uh, decided to um, look at two types of uncertainty. Uh, one is model uncertainty, and another one is data uncertainty. Uh, we have taken this uh, notation and method methods for estimating the values of uncertainty uh, from works by Kendall and Gall and Gall and Garamani, um, uh, which, which are coming from uh, computer vision field, actually. So um, briefly, uh, model uncertainty comes from model parameters and can be explained away given uh, enough data. So the method uh, to estimate it uh, is called um, Monte Carlo dropout um, method. Uh, so it's taking from Angar and Garamani. I am not going to basically go into details of these methods. Uh, the idea behind this method is to um, use dropout at also at testing time of a model and to obtain uh, multiple predictions. And then the uncertainty will be calculated based on the variance um, across those predictions. Um, data uncertainty uh, also can be referred to as aleatoric uncertainty is associated with properties of the data, uh, for example, imperfections in measurements. So the method uh, to estimate this data uncertainty we took from Kendall and Gall, um, and this is sort of a learned uh, parameter um, and the model basically incorporated to be one of the model, model's outputs. Uh, so what we did is uh, our model predicts uh, for us a, a label uh, of like a prediction and also uh, a, a, a number which indicates model uncertainty and a number that indicates data uncertainty. And we assume that instances with high levels of uncertainty are likely to be incorrectly predicted. And we want to filter out these instances and explore the trade-off between model performance and the coverage of the data set. And so we perform this uh, instance rejection or removal in two ways. One is unsupervised and another one is supervised. So for unsupervised approach, um, we remove portions of the data set um, corresponding to the instances with highest uncertainty separately for each type of uncertainty. And then we evaluate performance on the, the, the rest of the data. And then for supervised approach, um, we simply trained a supervised meta classifier on a development set uh, using features composed of uncertainty estimates, uh, which allows us to combine multiple uncertainty types in the same model. And then this model, supervised model, uh, predicts whether an instance is correctly or incorrectly predicted. And then we remove instances classified as incorrect and evaluate performance on the rest. Um, and we decided to compare performance on, of two rather simple um, models here, random forest and SVMs. Uh, so we evaluated this approach on um, three different data sets. Um, theme, uh, which contains uh, rumors that are true, false, or unverified, and also Twitter 15 data set and Twitter 16 data set. Uh, we used leave one event out cross validation for theme and uh, five fold cross validation for Twitter 15 16 as provided by the authors of the data set. Um, so there's an interesting and significant difference between the data set is that Twitter 15 and 16 data sets are very balanced in terms of classes and the, each of the folds for cross validation is also very balanced in terms of classes and they're not split into like separate events. And they also contain uh, non rumors. Whilst theme uh, has a very, very different number of threads in each of the event and very different class balance within each of the events. Um, so moving on to results. Um, so as I mentioned here, we remove the instances with high uncertainty and um, 
and then we evaluate performance on the rest of the data. So basically here you can see um, the first bar uh, indicates um, the accuracy of the model with all of the instances present. Um, and we compare the effects of removing each types of uncertainty. So aleatoric is data uncertainty, variation ratio can here refers to the model uncertainty and the softmax is just this softmax output, single output of the model. And yeah, so the following bars uh, show, you know, like the performance when we remove portions of the data set. And basically for each of the data set, uh, whilst we see a drastically different performance between Twitter 15, 16 and theme, uh, we do see um, performance improvement based on this rejection method. Um, So uh, interestingly here, uh, we find that in theme, uh, we see greater improvement uh, when we remove instances based on data uncertainty, whilst in Twitter 15 and 16, we see greater improvement when we remove um, based on model uncertainty. Um, well, our hypothesis is that could be to do with uh, like this difference in data that I have just described. Um, where folds and theme differ widely in size and class balance. Um, so the next slide shows uh, results of using sort of supervised rejection um, and comparing into removing the same number of instances uh, using unsupervised method. So if we compare supervised versus unsupervised, um, we can see that supervised one uh, leads to better results in terms of performance. Um, and if we compare um, the two approaches for supervised rejection, um, we can see that random forest leads to removing higher amount, higher proportion of instances, but this also reaches um, higher performance in most of the cases. Um, so the next uh, set of experiments um, is uh, timeline experiments. Uh, so rumor verification is a time sensitive problem. So, and as new information comes to light, the level of certainty is expected to change, uh, giving insights into model predictions. And so we explore the dynamics of uncertainty as a discussion unfolds. So what we have done here is um, we have deconstructed the timeline of development of a conversation uh, tweet by tweet, starting uh, with just the source tweet and adding one response at a time. Um, and then we obtained model predictions and associated uncertainties for each subtree uh, to see the effect that each added response has. Um, so this slide shows an example uh, of a timeline of changes in predictions and uncertainty levels over time. So this is an example for one single conversation thread. Uh, so it's not like aggregated. Uh, so this particular uh, conversation uh, was discussing a true rumor. Uh, however, uh, it was um, predicted by a model <laughs> as false on most of the time steps. Um, so one, one hypothesis I had before starting this study is that, um, you know, as conversation unfolds, we get more information. So therefore we should get more certain in our decision. However, this is not the case. Um, well, I guess um, we, we, we see instead of fluctuations in uncertainty levels. Um, I guess this is to do with not all responses being equally relevant but also responses having uh, different types of stance towards a rumor as well. Um, so it's quite interesting to see here that a, at uh, this time step T1, a model actually had a correct prediction and it had a low level of uncertainty about it, uh, but it probably was confused by a further discussion and it resulted in an incorrect prediction. Um, so 
I, uh, generally, uh, we suggest that this kind of analysis can be used to analyze not uh, just the effect of stance, but also study other properties of rumor spread in time. Uh, potentially, maybe to identify the lowest point of uncertainty in the timeline and use that as a prediction. Um, Right, so um, the conclusions are that uncertainty estimates can be leveraged to remove instances that are likely to be incorrectly predicted and therefore to be prioritized by a human fact checker. Um, and also they can be used in, in order to look into uh, changes in model decisions over time. I think there is a lot to sort of, there's still a lot of questions I have about how like how this works. Uh, and it would be interesting to perform comparisons with other methods of uncertainty estimation uh, or incorporate uncertainty to affect model decisions uh, in an active learning setup. And also further investigate links between uncertainty values and linguistic features of the input. Um, so, so here, uh, I guess I end my presentation and I also just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about my current project and a couple of events that I'm co-organizing. Um, so our current project that only have started recently, uh, this January uh, is called uh, Panacea. It's, um, we are planning to, to study uh, misinformation that is being spread uh, about um, COVID-19. Um, and we are planning to research methods for veracity assessment of claims uh, by integrating information from multiple sources and building a knowledge network that enables cross verification. Uh, so currently we are on our first objective of uh, collecting the relevant data from social media platforms and authoritative resources. Uh, so these are, um, the, well, um, these are PIs of the project, the supervisors that uh, we're working with. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention today is that we are organizing a mediate workshop at ICWSM conference. Um, it will be virtual. Uh, it will happen on June 7th. And the topic this year is misinformation, automation uptake, and digital governance. Uh, so here you can see a, a link to the event on the, sl on the slide. Um, so we currently um, are accepting, looking forward to uh, submissions of technical papers and uh, talk proposals. Uh, so yeah, please consider participating in this event. And these are uh, my colleagues, co-organizers of this event and also of uh, Turing Special Interest Group, Media in the Digital Age, um, where we focus on discussions around the state of, the, of media in, well, nowadays, and all the challenges that arise in context of misinformation and so on, uh, and organize uh, events related to that. Um, and then last, but not least, um, there is an upcoming conference for Truth and Trust Online. Uh, this is the third year of this conference existing. Uh, it's also a virtual event. Um, it also really is looking to accept uh, papers and talk proposals. Uh, so this uh, conference is um, is an, is an interesting venue because it's aiming to bring together researchers, uh, practitioners, journalists, and platforms uh, to discuss uh, basically the state of truth and trust online, discuss problems and challenges in, in this field. Um, so it's a great event. So again, wanted to bring it to your attention. Um, yeah, I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, yeah, so that, that concludes my talk. Uh, Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Elena. Um, so I think now we can start uh, with a few Q&A. Uh, the first one comes from Christina and she asks, how do you build the conversation tree? Uh, is it from mentions or from retweets? Uh, conversation tree is, um, these are direct replies. Um, yeah. I think okay. I, I will show an example. 
Yeah, basically, it yeah, it's direct responses to the source tweet and then responses to the responses. I see. Um, and a comment I wanted to make though was uh, you were mentioning how leave one event out CB had twenty percent lower. I think you said accuracy, um, um, which actually was it accuracy. I'm sorry. Um, but but it actually sort of agrees with some of the stuff that uh, I've been doing uh, in in some paper I've worked on with um, uh, a few other researchers here, including Christina Lerman uh, and uh, and uh, another researcher called Nazgul. Um, we were finding that um, that when you split by in our case for sensors of humans, splitting by random events versus splitting by people themselves create two different accuracy measures. When you split by people, oh. the accuracy drops uh, significantly. And we believe the issue is related to what's called uh, data, the data shift problem, or that there is a covariate or feature distribution shift. And uh, for that, while we didn't have enough data, because this data has to be for humans, especially sensor data for humans, you don't, you just don't have enough data to make a really uh, uh, good, say, neural network or anything like that. But with enough data, and presumably the data you have would be enough, one could use methods uh, in transfer learning or domain adaptation to be able to transfer uh, these, these shifted data from, from each event into a more common distribution that a model might work better on. Um, so I just wanted to mention that to you. Uh, as it, While it didn't work for us, and if you didn't know about it, it might work for you with your larger data set. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds it sounds yeah like like what what I am also witnessing with my experiments, and yeah, I think that yeah that's that's exactly I, I also refer to this problem of you know of struggling to generalize to unseen events like it's it is a, a domain adaptation problem in a way because each new rumor is a new topic a new domain. Um, yeah, I also know that my collaborators who are working in um, mental health um, they. I think they were trying to predict mood and they also found well quite similar pattern where they were um when they split data again like by days of and then different people well the same person can be in separate folds like in training and in testing just in different time periods the performance would be relatively high however when they kind of test their models on unseen people then the performance would be very low because sort of i guess the average mood for a person is not known so also similar no very good very good point thank you. thank you um are there other questions that people might have um i guess one another question i had is have you explored uh or or are you maybe trying to explore to address that uh, potential issue i mentioned before about how the, the rumors could be manipulated to sound more true just by replies being fakely saying that this rumor is true. Have you explored adding um, uh, bot verification or bot detection methods along with this rumor verification? So that like a bot detection method could say, is this an automated account or are the replies automated? And if so, you might consider uh, their opinions with a lower weight. Yeah, personally, I, I haven't done that. Um, I have, I have briefly looked at some point into um, kind of building a user representation using like line model based on their connections. I mean, in my data set, it didn't come to to like improvements like I was working on team data set. But yeah, I did not look into like directly, you know, identifying bots and so on. Um, and to be honest, I don't think I have seen works that combine the two. Like I've seen work, obviously, that just tries to identify bots. But I haven't seen those that combine first step as identifying bots and then the second uh, trying to use that to affect veracity. Well, that sounds interesting and relevant, <laughs> of course. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm definitely interested in, in that, that sort of whatever research comes in the future. Um, in any case, uh, are there any other questions that people might have? Feel free to uh, ask them out loud.
Uh, all right, uh, I guess with that, I think we can end it then. Um, I think you can uh, stop the recording, Mara.